Now it is my great honor to introduce you all to our opening keynote presenter, Dr. Carolyn Finney. Dr. Finney is an author, a storyteller, and a cultural geographer. She is deeply interested in issues related to identity, difference, creativity, and resilience. She has worked tirelessly to combat the narrative that people of color are absent from environmental spaces. Her book, Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors, dispels the erasure of Black Americans in outdoor spaces. I just want to let you all know, all of our convening participants will be receiving a copy of Dr. Carolyn Finney's book. So now, please join me in sharing some love for Dr. Carolyn Finney. Love, <laughs> yes. Um, can everybody see me and hear me well? Excellent, Sonia, thank you so much for that warm and um, authentic and generous introduction. And man, I cannot tell you how much I wish I was in the room with everybody. I am living here in Burlington, Vermont. I've been here for about, since about fall of 2019. And I live alone. And while I've got some good friends out in the community, I basically haven't been seeing too many people. So I just love knowing that you all are out there. And for at least a short period of time, um, I feel really connected. So I, normally, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to folks, and, and let me, back up a little bit. I want to thank Sonia and thank everybody at um, the Resilient Communities in Resilient Communities here for inviting me to be part of this. Actually, I know that part of what I'm you know, supposed to do today is like lay down some stuff, but I'm going to be honest with you. I'm here to share some love and get some love and give some as well. And so I thought kind of differently about how I might come in here and talk today because the truth is I don't often find myself um, having this conversation where everybody in the room is a person of color, right? And I'm just saying that broadly and generously. And um, so I, I want to take advantage of that in a really different way. And also because I think I owe you all something. So I want to come at it that way. Um, so I don't have any images today because I kind of want to keep, I don't know, a sense of you on, um, on the camera with me. And I'm looking down at my notes when you see me look down to kind of keep me um, in line. So. The first thing that I want to say is I talk about the stories of now, and I've been saying this a lot, but let me back up a little bit, <laughs> stories of now. So since last May, this is about the 106th time I've gotten on Zoom or some platform, some virtual platform to have this conversation in some form. And I'm under-reporting, and I know I am. And part of the reason that that's true is because this is what I do, I would say 75% of the time. I'm here in Vermont because I do this part-time residency at Middlebury College and their Franklin Environmental Center there. And so I do some of this work on campus, except I haven't been on campus in a year. But the rest of the time is, you know, people invite me in to talk, to engage, to facilitate, to consult, to hold conversation around on these issues in a very particular way. Um, and so when I think about stories of now, I usually put up an image and the image is a map of the United States, but it's the political map that privileges sort of the Democratic and Republican Party so we can see all the divisiveness of the red states, blue states. It's a large picture of George Floyd, um, obviously representing his murder, representing the history of his murder of people like him. Um, over time, as well as a picture of that represents COVID. Um, and in the broadest sense, I think we're all like existing either within that or in a relationship to all those issues. Um, whether we accept that, deny that, or stand somewhere in the middle, it's there and it's happening all the time. When Derek Chauvin was convicted last week on three counts of murder of George Floyd, um, I was watching CNN and the white journalist Jake Tapper was having a conversation with the black journalist, Don Lemon. And what Jake Tapper said to Don Lemon, he said, you know, in 2016, um, when, black, when George Floyd was murdered and Black Lives Matter hit the streets hard, um, you had a lot of white politicians and other white folks in power who are tentatively, if at all, even mentioning the words Black Lives Matter. Folks like Hillary Clinton were kind of saying all lives matter, like all this stuff is skirting, is ducking and weaving, negotiating and navigating what it is. He said, but four years later, 
all these same people, they're like owning it. They're like Black Lives Matter and white supremacy. I think I read an article a few months ago in the Washington Post where, by Hillary Clinton, where she must have said white supremacy out loud at least four or five times. I was in shock, right? So it's like, wow, and Jake Tapper saying, so don't you think there's a sea change happening? And Don Lemon looked at Jake, you know, with that way that he gets that look on his face. And he said, well, I think there may have been a sea change in terms of awareness but there has not been a sea change in terms of practice. And I wrote that down. I was like, mm, that's right, right, right. Where's the practice? Just being awoke and just being aware does not make change, right? It may be the beginning of it, the thing to see it. And I imagine when I looked at all the organizations represented here today, I don't have to tell you what that looks like on the ground because that's where you live every single day. Um, so I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about how do you meet this moment? How do I meet this moment? Not how do you meet it? Because I, I don't need to tell you what to do. But how do I meet this moment, right? How do I show up? And the thing, one of the things that I've been saying to people is that you've got to be able to meet people where they are, which means you first have to know exactly where it is that you stand. So I want to talk about that. But before I do that, I want to read a couple of quotes and get, get you started or get me started, I should say. That's actually more to the truth. Um, I was thinking about Audre Lorde the black gay playwright, I'm, a, I'm sorry, writer, poet, who had said, without community, there is no liberation. But community must not mean a shedding of our differences, nor the pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist, right? Audrey always knew what to say. But I wanna follow that up with a, black, a quote from the black writer, Toni Morrison, who said, you wanna fly? You gotta give up some of the shit that weighs you down. So when I read that, I was as usual. When I read something by Toni Morrison, I was like, okay, what does that mean? So in order to be authentic with you and honest, I need to share some of the shit that weighs me down. So can I say some things, right? I feel like I know we don't really know each other, but I think we kind of know each other. Or at least I think we kind of know where each other is standing at this moment, being in the brown and black skins that we are in, showing up every day to do this work. So I want to say some things and I want to talk about some of the things that weigh me down in a moment in time that in this brown body that some people still won't see. Um, this year has been a little rough, right, as it's been for a lot of us. And I think that's an understatement. Um, but I question myself more than usual about why I persist in doing this work. Why do I persist saying pretty much yes every time some organization, business, agency, museum, botanical garden, faith-based institution, often predominantly white, you know, almost always related to the environment, asks me to engage with them around this work, right? Um, so I want to talk about a little bit and let you know a little bit what folks usually ask of me. Diversity, this is what they asked me to talk about, diversity, inclusion, race in the environment, Outreach, reaching out, skill building, communication, diversity and inclusion. Risk, relevancy, resilience, diversity and inclusion. Broadening our constituency, diversifying our staff, retaining our black and brown folks, diversity and inclusion. Power and privilege, diversity and inclusion. Equity, equality, equanimity, diversity and inclusion. Decolonization and reparations, give it back, give it out and give it up. Storytelling as a way in, narrative as a, as a way out, having the conversation, diversity and inclusion, building capacity, expanding vision, strengthening relationships, diversity and inclusion, the past, the present, the future, diversity and inclusion. Do you know and do you think and how do we and why should we and can you help and can you join and can you do it? Diversity and inclusive, which and here's the biggest thing for me, assumes that we want to be included in a thing that has long been broken. So I'm always thinking about how I navigate and negotiate that because I never want to forget anybody's humanity and I want to be able to meet people where they are. And I want to take those three steps as Senator James Clyburn said about three steps to your opponent. If there's five steps, he's willing to take three. So what does that mean for me when it's always already been broken? So I'm already having a problem when we say DEI. So what do I do with that? I'm tired and emotional labor is a thing. So again, I had to go back to the beginning for myself in terms of where I stand, my own story. Why do I do this work? 
And so I have to talk about my parents because I always talk about my parents. I come from the Tough It Out family. And I think some of you will recognize this because probably a lot of you come from the Tough It Out family. I mean, literally back in my 20s, I remember when I got married too young. That's a whole nother story. I was living in Brooklyn, New York at the time. And I remember when my parents came to get all my stuff out of my apartment. We are not the touchy, feely, huggy, lovey family. I, I'm 61 years old. So when I was a kid living at home, there was no Oprah. There was no Cosby. Thank so there's a way within which we weren't doing that huggy lovey thing. It's a tough it out family. And as my parents took my few boxes and got in the elevator into my building on Ocean Parkway, and I'm standing there with tears rolling down my face, which I never usually let them see, my mother just looked at me very gently and said, well, you got to tough it out. You know, I've come to know who my parents are more and more the older I get. And as I look closer at their lives, my parents who grew up black, who grew up poor in Floyd, Virginia during segregation, right? And the story is not new, right? But it, it took some remembering for me to understand what it was like for them. My dad going off to fight in the Korean War, but coming back and getting none of the amenities and none of the gratitude because he was a black man at that time that he came back. And like a lot of black people in the 50s, and not only black people, right? He decided he was going to be, move north with my mother to New York because maybe he'll get a better job opportunity. And the, New or the Northeast, man, is different. Of course, what my parents say now is that the racism operates differently in the Northeast, right? In the South, it's in your face. In the North, it's in your back. So this really understanding about systemic racism is embedded in everything is something my father always understood, even though he only had a high school education. The job my father got, well, he ended up being the chauffeur, the caretaker, the landscape gardener for a very wealthy Jewish family that, owns a, that owned a 12-acre estate 30 minutes outside of New York City in Westchester County. My mom was a sometime housekeeper on that estate. My parents were on that estate for nearly 50 years, caring for land that had vegetable gardens and flower gardens and fruit trees trees and wildlife and um, they had a small pond. That was their job day in and day out. That was their labor. That was where they put a lot of their love. They thought they couldn't have kids and they adopted me. I understand that one of the main reasons I'm drawn to this work because the question of belonging is personal to me. What does it mean to belong? I don't even have a sense of who I am blood related to in this world. So what does that mean? Where do I belong? So I hadn't even gotten to the question of race yet until I was nine years old walking home from school one day to that very wealthy white neighborhood where we he happened to live because my parents worked there and getting stopped by a white policeman who wanted to know where I was going. I'm nine. I told him I'm coming home from school. I'm going home. He asked me if I worked there. I'm looking at the dude and I'm thinking I'm nine. But all I say is, no, I live there. And he let me go. And as an adult, I'm still thinking about it. I think about it when I read a story last summer about Brianna Nelson Hicks, a young black girl in Wellington, Florida, a very wealthy, all white neighborhood. And she lives there with her grandfather. And she's walking with her two white friends and and there's a video of an older white man yelling at her, telling her she doesn't belong. And it hit home like I was nine years old. I flew back to 1969 just like that, just like that. I think about that when 40 years into my parents caring for that land, the original owners, one had already died, one was about to die. And she was clear, like, what's going to happen to my parents? They can't stay on this land. That land was worth over $3 million. Property taxes were over $125,000 a year. What's going to happen to my, my family? Right. So she builds a house for them in Leesburg, Virginia, which is a lovely house on a half an acre of land. She passes away. My father at her bedside because power is always complicated. Privilege is always complicated. I had to take a breath. <laughs> um, she dies. The new owner comes on. My parents stay on till 2003 because they always need people caring for that land full time. They finally find a family from the Dominican Republic to take over caring for that land. My parents leave. They move down. They both, but in particular, my dad got incredibly depressed because he talks about missing the land. What does it mean to love and labor on land for that long? And as though to add insult to injury, we hear that a conservation easement has been placed on that piece of land, meaning in perpetuity, Supposedly, everything is protected. We know this because one of his old neighbors sends a copy of a letter, which I have. I read the letter. I look at all the beautiful pictures of the estate, all the conservation values it lists on that estate. And at the end of the letter, it talks about and it thanks the new owner for his conservation mindedness. He'd been on the land for five years, but there was nothing in the letter honoring thinking and thinking about 
and thanking my parents who'd cared for that land for nearly 50 years and just that fast they were gone from that environmental history. And of course, it got me thinking about all the people in this country who've been gone for that environmental history and how far back we want to go because my parents aren't the owners either. Who was on there before and before and before and before? Right. So I come to this moment with that bias. I come to that moment with this perspective. I tell everybody I was privileged enough to go back to school, not privileged enough to have all this debt that I'll have for the rest of my life in order to do that. But because I wanted to better understand this and give myself some, mm, I don't want to say anything like weapons, but I wanted to be able to come into a room into a predominantly white room, into a predominantly white conversation about what the environment is, what conservation is, and how we should be in relationship to it with something else to say. And I wanted it to be personal because I couldn't help it but it be personal. I'm already gone off my notes. So then I had to think even more broadly about the larger story, not just my story, but go back to the beginning. And I often talk about this moment of convergence and sometimes I put up this slide and on the slide you see pictures of indigenous removal, you see pictures of um, enslaved Africans, you see pictures of Japanese internment, of Chinese, people of Chinese descent working the railroad, of immigrants crossing the border, of pollution being done to the land. And I always have this famous picture of John Muir or the great conservationist and Gifford Pinchot who founded the forest forestry, the idea of managing the resources for our use, which we privilege like nothing else. It is always about us all the time, isn't it? In that narrative. And I usually talk about them, but actually I don't want to talk about them today. I want to remember the first two truths here, the places we can never get far from. First, all this land was stolen. You can ask any indigenous person, all this land was stolen, number one. Number two, we enslaved another group of people to work that land for free, and they were our property. Think about that. I don't even want to get to things like the Chinese Exclusion Act and the way we left them out of honoring them for all the work they did on the railroad, Japanese internment, every single immigrant that came south over the border. I don't even want, I don't even have to go there because we could keep going. We could keep going to right now, right? So I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. Um, for the past few months, I've been grappling with the impulse to run, right? I just, so I'm just being honest. I can't get anywhere. I can't get out of this apartment, <laughs> right? I can't, you know, wherever you go, there you are. I tell folks all the time. Well, I don't tell everybody all the time, but I say, I just can't be incognito, right? Because here I am. Um, I want to tell you some other things that I'm tired of. I'm tired of COVID. I'm tired of masks and Zooms. I'm tired of me, myself, and I, of white splaining, diversity and inclusion, white supremacy. I'm tired of politics and the lies on the news every night, all the time drowning out all the other news of need, possibility, and presence in spite of. I used to say that I'm tired of airports with carpets, but now I'd just be happy to see an airport. I'm tired of cancel culture, wokeness masquerading as realness, practice, or change. I'm tired of books like American Dirt. You might remember that book. It was written in an old way by a self-identified white woman who told a story about Mexican immigrants that continues to infuse our national imagination and justification for putting children, for putting anybody in cages. I'm tired of the fact that there have been over 3,800 anti-Asian racist incidents since last year, fueled by an ex-president and a long history that refuses to be held accountable. I'm tired of the silence, the elephant in the room, the race card, though I've often joked around that maybe one Halloween I'm going to go with the race card. I'm tired of appropriation, extraction, and co-optation, and the boldness of white supremacy reinscribed. I'm tired of black and brown people dying because of the hands of history that won't be denied except when shown a mirror, and they still won't believe it, even when we show them a mirror. I'm tired. But I also have to think about the fact that I'm not here simply for me. I'm not here simply for me. That's not how I was raised. One of the things I love about black and brown people is that that's not how a lot of us were raised, right? So I want to talk a little bit about Mavine Betch. I just want to mention some people. You're the people that I try to remember who've always shown up, who still show up in very particular ways. Mavine Betch was a black woman who grew up back in the 40s and 50s in South Florida. Mavine Betch grew up in a very wealthy black family. Mavine Betch 
thought she'd be an opera singer. She went to Germany for a while, but then she came back and she became so involved with the environment, she gave away all her wealth to environmental causes. Her great-grandfather, A.L. Lewis, back in the 40s, they weren't allowed to go to the same beach as white people, so they just bought a beach. It's on Amelia Island. It's called American Beach, right? Ma Bean talked about fighting for all the time, that place, not only the place, but the African-American stories in that place. Before Ma Bean died back in 2005, Ma Bean said to me, I am the freest person you will ever meet. Because when I gave away the money, and she gave it all away to environmental causes, that woman was living for a while on a chaise lounge on the beach. She said, when I gave away all the money, I was able to do exactly what it is I needed to do. I want to talk about Carrie and Marie Dan, Mary Dan, they're Western Shoshone Nation. They're from the Western Shoshone Nation. Um, they've been fighting for the last 40 years for land rights and sovereignty. Their fight has been against the U.S. government, about the U.S. government's attempts to take over traditional Shoshone lands in Nevada, part of 60 million acres that was guaranteed to them in the 1863 Treaty of Ruby Valley. There's an incredible um, film about their life called American Outrage, and yes, it is an outrage. I want to talk about it, and I have to think about Susanna Almanza. Susanna, Susanna Almanza is a Latinx activist from East Austin, Texas, who has been honored for her work spearheading an effort that resulted in the removal of oil tanks from her community that were causing serious health issues. She's the executive director of People Organized in Defense of Earth and Her Resources. About 2014, I was sitting on a panel with her. And she got up and she looked at all of us and she said, we all have to remember how to take off our shoes and remember what it's like to get dirty. And I take that with me every day. And I also want to honor and think about Redeema Pandey. Redeema Pandey is a child. Redeema Pandey is from India. She filed a lawsuit against the Indian government for failing to take action against climate action. She did it when she was nine years old. Okay. And she's still fighting. I believe her father worked in forestry, her mother was an activist, so it ran in her family in a very particular way. We may not hear of her like we hear of Greta Thunberg, and I don't have to diminish Greta Thunberg to make space for Redeema Pandey, because that in and of itself is a problem, but I have to think about what Redeema Pandey is doing. And if she's showing up every day ever since she is nine, I can absolutely show up every day. How am I doing for time? Let me check my time because I got two more things I have to say. Yeah, okay. Two more things I want to say. I've been thinking about the idea of the long game, right? Because I could go on and I could enjoy myself going on naming all the people that I want to think about and honor and remember, right? The ancestors and the ancestors broadly, not just my black ancestors, but my brown ancestors, my white ancestors, my non-human ancestors. Like, what does that mean for me? And the practice is deep. Like, I, I can never stop because I'm not always that good at it, right? But I have to think about how I show up every single time. And even when I say white ancestors, it, it messes with my head a little bit. And I remember I will not give up my humanity because somebody else has given up their humanity when they look at me and those like me, but I will not do it. I just have to work a little bit harder to be able to see everyone's humanity in the same way right? When the inauguration took place this year, I was watching it like a lot of people, man. I was glued for about 10 hours. But the piece that really stuck out for me, beside Amanda Gorman's amazing poem, was when a Republican senator from Missouri, Roy Blount, presented newly minted Joe Biden, newly minted President Joe Biden, with this painting called Landscape with Rainbow. And it looked like, you know, something, it was from 1859 when this man Robert S. Duncanson painted it. It looked like those kind of bucolic landscape, American landscape paintings you often see from that time, except it had a rainbow. So at first, I didn't really think anything about it. I was just looking at it like, yeah, it's another one of those, that bucolic landscape, that sublime thing, that ignoring what else was going on at the time, until they said that he was black. And then I had to, I was looking it up real fast. I was like, what? And I started reading about this man who was, of European ancestry and African ancestry. I was reading about this man who they said suffered from some degree of mental illness because 1859, slavery was in place and he was living in a black body. And even though he was free, he was living in a black body, right? And I said for him to paint a landscape with a rainbow, rainbows are for me symbolic of a future, of a possibility, of a potential, means he must have been playing the long game. 
Exactly 100 years ago in 1959, I was born. And I imagine that he knew he would never be able to see fully what he dreamt had to be possible, what he dreamt had to become real, what had to be happening. But somehow he was playing the long game. It was less about his presence and it was more about what he created and what he was able to do. I think about Henry Aaron, who the baseball player, and I'm calling him Henry Aaron on purpose because when he died a couple of months ago, I read how, you know, a lot of us call him Hank Aaron, but what I didn't know, that did you know that the reason he was called Hank Aaron in the press is because a white PR person thought Hank Aaron made him more friendly to white people. He actually preferred to be called Henry Aaron. And I wanna read a quote from Henry Aaron. He said, my motto was always to keep swinging. Whether I was in a slump or feeling badly or having trouble off the field, the only thing to do was to keep swinging, which is something I believe our ancestors and ourselves have always been good at. So I wanna leave you with this last thing that I wrote. It's I wrote and the last time I read a piece of this, I read it for a audience of just black and brown women who work in the environment at a retreat. This was last February, the last time I was able to get on a plane and be in a room with folks like yourself. But I amended it and added some things for you today. But the inspiration for this, aside from you, was a story I read a couple of days ago in the Washington Post. And it was about a young black girl named Nanny. She was born May 26th, 1848 and she died May 18th, 1856 at the age of seven years old. And she's buried in a historical African-American cemetery in Georgetown. And if you look up the article, the woman who wrote the article said that there's always every year people, there's somebody comes in and leaves beautiful toys and statues there for this little girl. And the person writing the article decided to show up to see it, but she didn't really want to know. She respected the fact it wasn't about identifying who the person was leaving it. So she wanted to respect that exchange, that commitment, that person showing up and remembering because it's on us, right? I'm tired of waiting for them to put me in the book, to put me on the shelf, to tell my story. Actually, they could never do it as well as I could. They could never do it as well as you can, right? So that is our job. So here's what I wanna leave you with. And this harkens back to my title of this talk where I started off by saying, we the people. And I call it, we the people. To those who rise and shine, for those who cannot, we the people who have shoveled and cried and groaned and tried to rise and shine for those who cannot. We the people whose joy is boundless, though bondage has been real. We the people who can no longer deal with no air to breathe, no place to stand that demands nothing less than all that we are. Not everyone deserves our truth. And yet, we the people rise and shine just like the sun, we will not be denied. So I wanna praise you. I wanna thank you for representing the power of your ancestors. I wanna praise you for representing the possibility of your ancestors. I may not know them, but I know you. I know your fire, your desires, I know your love. I wanna praise you. I wanna call out your beauty, your wit, your badassness, your always looking good, your freshness and your freshness. I wanna praise you, all the colors of the earth reflected in your skin, in your eyes and in your dreams of how we might be better. I wanna praise you. The sound of your voice is like thunder and rain in the ocean and pain of knowing more than you should and being told you are less than you are. I wanna call out your children, those of your body, bodies and those of your heart who look to you and see the sun and it is warm and it is light and it is you. I wanna praise you for your laughter that feeds our spirit and releases us from the bondage of limitation that was never ours to bear. I wanna praise you for showing up and showing out over and over again. I wanna praise you for knowing who you are and knowing who I can be. Because we, the people, thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Finney. That was amazing. Um, that was amazing. I don't have any other words, but appreciate you so much um, for pouring into us and sharing that. Um, I'm going to invite everyone as questions are arising, please um, type them into the Q&A tab. And we have um, about 25 minutes to have some discussion with Dr. Finney. So I'm um, looking forward to this time. So we have um, our first question Excellent. from Angela Park. And she says, in the season of DEI, how do you address the issue of not wanting to be included? Or should we request that the resources that the privileged people possess to achieve equity? Yeah, great question. So if I heard that right, Angela, thank you for the question. Uh, how not to, how do I address the issue of not being included? Um, well, one of the things that I, for me, one of the things that I always do is actually change the language. You know, I, I you know, I decide that, you know, really, what are we saying? So I'm going to side go sideways for a second. When people talk about sustainability, the thing that I say, so what is it that you're trying to sustain? Because for me, this is all about relationship, whether it is relationship to place, a river, a forest, a piece of land, or a relationship to a person. And for me, you can't talk about one without talking about the other. So if we have to talk about relationship and sustainability, I actually am not interested in sustaining the relationships that we've been having for the last 450 years. You know, so what do we got to do about that? So I play with the inclusion that way. And I actually say, you know, I'm actually not less interested in being in included and more interested in having a relationship of reciprocity because you including me doesn't actually demand you have to change and Angela I'm not pointing to you I'm just saying whoever it is right who's got who seems to have the resources and the power I'm not necessarily interested in being included in what you've created because what you've created is kind of problematic what I'm interested in is how you get to step outside of that because I'm already outside of that. And how do we have a conversation and create something new, which demands entirely different kinds of structures and formations. That's how I address it. I come at it either. I call it my backdoor strategy, which isn't all that backdoor. And I say the thing I said, like, I'm actually not going to make it. Let's not let's deal with the, the assumptions and expectations of DEI. And I know, and, and I want to say this, I actually work with a lot of white folks who are, I can tell whose heart is in the right place, who are coming to it, sometimes confused, sometimes afraid, but actually are coming to it, right, are coming to it. And so I always come to it with, I say, you know, what I call my own radical vulnerability, meaning that my heart is open, which doesn't mean I'm going to be any less angry, any less concerned about whether what you're going to do when I open up. I have to watch it because you may not even know it because sometimes that's how it happens. Whop! You know, I get whopped and you didn't even know you whopped me. And so I have to spend the time figuring out how to recover from the whop and then strategize about how do I let you know about the whop and then I find I'm teaching you about the whop. And meanwhile, I'm the one who got whopped, right? So for me, it is deciding beforehand. And I know I can say it in the shorthand like that and I know everybody out there knows what I'm saying. For me, it is like I come in going, well, it's not DEI that I'm interested in. What, what are we really saying? Because, you know, ever since Christopher Columbus lost his way, it's always been diverse up in this joint. Ask any indigenous person who's been here. All the diversity within ind the indigenous peoples who are here and were here. So we don't even have to get to anybody else, right? You know, the fact that we talk about it like it's something new, at least for predominantly white organizations who have, the, you know, a lot of the resources and a lot of the power for all the reasons that we know historically, the legacy of that. Um, I challenge all the terms. And sometimes when I'm feeling particularly cocky, I'm like, I got some terms of my own. And I'd love to invite you into conversation about it because, you know what, when you've got people who've been saying this, fighting this, showing up for 450 years, we got skills. We got skills. We don't even need any special degree because we got all the special degrees. We, you know, we've had to have the special degrees. Ducking and weaving, we can do it better than both. <laughs> I mean, you don't need, we don't got to go to special school for it, you know. We have work we have to do. But that's not actually where our primary work is because we've been doing that for so long. We probably do it second nature. Sometimes I think I'm sleeping and dreaming 
and ducking and weaving, you know? So that's how I deal with it is like, I've thought about it. I'm not waiting. I'm not saying you're saying this, Angela. I'm not saying waiting for them to see what they have to offer and what they're going to say. I come in with something to place on the table. One of my favorite things is to say lately is you may not have to throw out the baby in the bathwater. I want to respect the knowledge, the work, the energy that has been put in, meaning that I don't believe this is just me, that any one group is going to get there on their own. I just don't believe it. We live on a diverse planet, right? So I'm just like, how can I be better in relationship across difference, which doesn't mean I'm going to agree with everybody because it isn't about agreement, right? Um, but I am really interested in how, <clears throat> I don't know, I'm really interested in how, I said, so you may not have to throw out the baby in the bathwater. I lost my way there for a second. But I always say, but you're going to have to throw out the bathtub. I'm sorry. Because that bathtub is a mess. That's the bathtub you're asking me to get in there with you? I don't think so. Besides the fact I actually don't like to take baths. I prefer showers and the water's dirty. Right. That bathtub was created at a time when people that look like me couldn't be engaged with that. And when you ask me to get in there, I somehow have to fit myself and look like you and get in there. And, you know, and that's not what I want to do. I'm interested in being whole because there's a healing that has to happen for a lot of us who look like a lot of us. Right. There's personal healing because there's personal pain. Doesn't mean I don't know how to have a good time. I know how to have a good time, though this year has been rough, but I still know how to have a good time. You know, we if we are in pain does not mean we don't know how to feel joy, right? But I'm not getting in that bathtub. And I got something better over here because I think we got something better going on over here. So that's how I come into the conversation. What is our place of power? And, and I'm not being naive about money, um, political support, all the ways within which I recognize that that is power. It operates in the system in a very particular way. And we have to navigate and negotiate that. I got that. But there's other power. As many of you already know this, I don't even have to tell you this because I know you know this already, which is how you're able to show up every day and do what it is you do. That's great. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, have you come across examples of shifted power structures that go beyond the limitations of DEI? Yes. So, <laughs> um, I'm, and, and this is, again, my bias. I sit on the board of an amazing organization run by a black woman in um, Boston called the Guild, the Sustainability Guild, John Asexian. Um, a number of years ago now, I don't know, I don't get my, I should know this number. I don't know if it's eight years or what it is, but she was in the middle of getting her doctorate at Harvard and she left it. And she's from the black community there and community of color. And she started this project that, you know, it's, you know, in terms of the money, the support, and there's been a lot of bumps in the road that she's building this structure that is going to be for and by the community, broadly defined, but largely community of color, working class folks, using everything from art to, to um, you know, helping folks get jobs during COVID, helping folks get food in their bellies. But every aspect of moving through that has taken way longer than it would a traditional organization trying to build something because Jonna didn't want to do it the old way. And so it meant also saying no to people. Suddenly, you know, white groups in power wanted to be part of this. Oh, this is especially in the last year. Oh, we want to get on board of this. This is looking good. Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. Right. And John would be like, you know, we might need that money, but no, we, we, we can't. No. I, we, first of all, relationship, integrity, we, it's got to be clear from the beginning. So it takes longer. But what she has been building, and I'm just, you know, I feel like I'm on for the ride. I mean, I try to give my assistance, but there's a team of people on the ground in Boston making it happen from where everyone that was hired to build the building was black or brown. Everybody like it's like all the choices, even in the way we have board meetings, even in the way we have a board meeting, is to think about how do we take the time to ask everybody, how are you? Really, what's going on? <laughs> because how do we hold each other as full human beings, not just as intellectual human beings, not as currency for where it is we want to go, but as whole people that are invested as whole people, 
because wherever we go, there we are. And because we have a, a team of ancestors watching every move that we do. And we have young people like Redeema Pandey who are doing it at nine, right? And so, yeah, we got to show up. And so that is the, the, the project that just jumps in my mind because every time we get on for a board meeting or I have a conversation, I've just been, because I've been following her for years, waiting for her to ask me to be part of it. I am just waiting for the invitation because I was like, I have, there's a lot for me to learn. I'm learning and contributing all at the same time. And for me, that is often the best kind of working relationship is that there's a recognition of the learning and the contributing to it, right? Um, so that we're all expanding and not static, right? And we're not static in an idea. One of the biggest challenges of so many of our agencies, institutions, and organizations for me is the rigidity of them. They're sort of frozen. Lynn dying, you know, even though the people that move through it are different and they're saying, we want to do it differently, but we're so frozen in time. You know, and we're saying you can't have it both ways. So yeah, let me stop talking. But yes, that was my <laughs> response to that. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. So this next question is really interesting. I feel like I've had a lot of conversations about this recently. Can you share your thoughts on the term people of color versus BIPOC? Oh do man. Do you think it contributes to the erasure of the unique experience of American blacks slash descendants of, of slaves? Okay, that you're, you, there was a little echo there, so I wanna make sure I got the last part. What I heard was, uh, what was the very last piece about the slaves? Yeah, I didn't hear that piece. Yeah. Jamie. Do you think it contributes to the erasure of the unique experience of Afri American Blacks or descendants of slaves? Okay, so woo, I, I, I had a feeling somebody, I said, somebody in this group's going to ask that question because it's up for me too. So I'm coming to it. So one of the things that I've been learning about and trying to understand, and actually I have to apologize particularly to any indigenous person in the audience that I normally say that I'm on the traditional land of the Abenaki people who yearn from Vermont and I forgot. And that's on me um, for that. One of the things that I've been learning, um, an Abenaki woman here named Judy Dow has been learning me, uh, is about land acknowledgments. And I didn't understand the history of them, which actually, as I understand it, come from a sort of truth and reconciliation in Canada with the First Nations people. And that at the core of understanding land acknowledgments, yes, on the surface, there's a kind of recognition of who are the first peoples, who are the peoples who are still here <laughs> and have been here on this land. But for it to be done really authentically, you have to have a true relationship with that place that you're saying that about. And true relationship takes time. So it can take you a couple of years to build a real true land acknowledgement, right? It's not enough just to say, you know, the Abenaki people, that's the beginning, but that's not, that ain't the real thing around that. But she had asked me, we got in a conversation because she said she was a, an African-American friend of hers. She was, they were having a, a lot of tension. They'd been good friends, but she had lately heard a land acknowledgement that included African-American enslaved people, the lands that had enslaved people working on them or lands that had belonged to African-Americans. And it really upset Judy, not because she didn't feel like there needed to be some recognition of and addressing of uh, lands that have also been long, belonged to those of African descent and, and, that's, and that, those lands have been removed. But it doesn't come from the same place as a land acknowledgement for indigenous people. And the people you saying it don't probably have no idea about that. They're just, they're trying to cover it all in one thing. Can we get it all in, right? So when the term BIPOC came out, um, I, I got, I was like, what? What? I have to keep looking it up. Like, what? I said, okay. To be honest with you, when people of color started, it used to bug me because I understood it as that just makes all non-white people together and it, it, it belies any specific history, unique, specific history. It denies a difference of who people are. I read an article, though, lately by, I believe it was a black woman who, though, was saying, and they were making a case for people of color over BIPOC because actually it is in part recognizing that people of color, you know, across the board in this country have been at the receiving end since the founding of this country of a set of wrongs, like 
they just been at the receiving end in different ways. It's it's shown up differently, whether it is the genocide of indigenous people, whether it's been the enslavement of people of African descent, again, whether it's been having Japanese people interned or, you know, Mexican, you know, people in, put in cages, whatever it is, we've done it over and over again, right? And so people of color has some power because it has a historical reference. I understand the BIPOC term is more of as of the moment because of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? There's a way within which it's honoring the moment of Black Lives Matter, not privileging it over all other experiences. I've always felt, and this is my opinion, you know, and my bias is that indigenous people have always gotten the short end of the stick in the larger narrative about race in this country. It becomes a, and not, don't even, did somebody say people of Asian descent or people, you know, Latinx, like we don't even multiracial, biracial. It's like, we seem to avoid complexity, right? And the idea that it's never been a singular narrative, the race narrative has never been singular. It's never been singular. And actually, did I happen to mention that whiteness is also diverse, right? We got a, there's a funky history up in there, but I don't even want to, I'm not trying to center that at all. I'm just throwing it out there that I recognize that that's also diverse and complicated, right? So I think, you know, when I use any of the terms and I play around with them all the time, just like I play around with, and I don't, and, and I mean this respectfully with, indigenous American Indian Native American. I did my homework and what I understood about the American Indian movement and what does indigenous, you know, encompass, which I think is a little broader than American Indian or Native American, because there are other people who call themselves indigenous to the land and the place. And there's room and expansion and I don't always get it right, you know, um, but I want to be able to show up to where I am in the conversation with it to show that I, I recognize and see a thing and I'm trying to learn a thing and know what it is. So the BIPOC, and I only use it once in a while, but I don't like it. You know, I want to say what I mean in any given moment. And even if what I mean is that I don't know what I mean at the moment then that's what I want to say. I don't know what I mean at the moment. I'm trying to honor and encompass and relate to and see a, a broader diverse in the truest sense of who we are. Um, I did a conversation, a public conversation last fall with the um, Native woman, woman stands shining, Pat McCabe. And we, we pretended it was a conversation just between us, but we knew other people were listening in. And we called it Red Nation, Black Nation to have this conversation around decolonization and reparations. Because I said, ooh, that's the real interesting. What was decenter whiteness? <laughs> I said, that for me is the real interesting. There's some, what are we going to do? Because we got some tension, you know? And there is. Is it, you know, I just read that article in the Atlantic by David Truer, the Native American who said, you've got to give the land, let the, let the, let the native people steward the land. And I'm actually, I'm in. But then I went, but what does that mean? How am I prepared to support? How, how, what do I got to do to be ready? Not what have they got to do to be ready. I do believe they've been ready for the last 450 years. What do I have to do to be ready as a black person? What do I have to do to be ready? I'm not off the hook because I'm black. You know, I got some issues. So if I'm going to be an honest relationship with any Native person, because I want to support that move, because that's going to take us somewhere we've never been. And for me, healing is in there for not just for Indigenous people, but for everybody. And maybe I will learn something as I think about reparations and everything that's been done to Black people and continues to be done to Black people. So then it will make me able to not only support my Indigenous brothers and sisters, but look at my Asian brothers and sisters and my Middle Eastern brothers and sisters and my Mexican brothers and sisters and on down the line because I will know how to pivot. I will know how to freely give without feeling like it's all going to be gone and extracted and used because that's what's happened in the past. I will know better how to do it, to develop trust and build it. And it is not about always getting it right, but it's just about showing up as authentically as I can do that. And any one term right now for me doesn't capture any of that, which means I need more time, which means I need more words. And so I've just decided to take it. That's what I, that's how I have to come at it. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, and this is a related question. Do you believe the use of the term black is considered more confrontational than the use of black or POC? 
And are there some experiences that are just best described as black? Oh my God, I love my people. I love my, I love the questions. I'm so happy right now. Cause these are, <laughs> I never get asked these questions. Um, so, <clears throat> okay. So I'm gonna tell some truth here that you know, I, I still haven't come to terms with. So I told you all that I'm adopted. I was adopted by black parents and raised black. And then my parents had two brothers. So your black family, the whole nine yards, treated black my whole life. And I'm going to come to the term black. Um, but I, you know, been trying to find out my biological roots and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And the last few years with the whole DNA thing, I said, oh, I'm going to do my DNA. Now, the adoption agency in New York City had told me a long time ago, they said, yes, your biological mother was black. You know, her parents were black. Uh, you know, your grand, your biological grandfather was a physicist for the government. Your biological grandmother was a home economics teacher. Your biological father was black, but we don't know as much about him. He was a couple of years older. So I had all this basic descriptive information, but whatever I knew, I was black. You know, for a long time, one of my aunts swore that my biological father was Colin Powell. No, I was like, it's not true. It's always somebody famous, but that's who they, you know, I, you know, I don't know where they got that from. So when I did my DNA a few years ago and I started getting back, first of all, you know, it tells you where regionally where you're from. And I was looking at, I think it was like 50, either 49, 50 or 51 percent, sub-Saharan Africa, Southern Africa. And I was like, oh, that's just. And then the other was kind of split. It was like 34 percent, the British Isles, some Scandinavia little bit of East Asian. That was, I, I was really excited about that one. But I'm still not putting it together. Maybe I've just never been that great at math. It wasn't until I got the mitochondrial DNA, your mother's mother line, that what I was seeing, Finland, Scotland, all these old, I'm like, what's going on? Where the African at? Recognizing, oh, based on this DNA, my biological mother was probably white, right? Um, a friend of mine who's white, who I've known for 40 years, uh, a good, good, She's a good person. We were actors together. We lived together for a while in Brooklyn back in the day. You know, we have kept in touch all these years. She met my family, spent time at my parents' house when we were both young in our 20s. Like, you know, we just known each other. You know, the friend that you talk to like maybe twice a year on your birthday who always remembers and on Christmas you had that long catch up conversation. Well, <clears throat> she lives out in LA. So we never ever, she was from Alabama originally, but she hasn't lived there in a lot of years. And we had, we never really talked about race. So stuff happened to me all the time as a kid, you know, and a teenager and during the time and I would tell her these things, but there was never any deep conversation around it. With everything happening with Black Lives Matter, we were talking about this on the phone. She kind of gets what I do for a living, but you know, I don't know that she really understood it. Finally, at the end of the conversation, because she knew about the DNA, she said to me, so, do you call yourself black, African-American, or white? Now, now, I, yeah, right, Jamie, I'm watching your face. So I'm on the phone and she can't see my, I, you know, I, like I was, like a head started spinning like Linda Blair in The Exorcist, you know, I'm like, how the F do you know me for 40 years and you're gonna ask me that question? But, you know, I'm gritting my teeth and she could tell the voice, everything changed. And I said, I'm black. And, and I started talking about how, I started giving her the, the, the educational lesson. And I said, you know, black is a political term. It comes out of the 60s because on my birth certificate, it says Negro, which it does, right? So it says Negro baby, right? And I said, because black people got tired of being named by white people. So black is about black beauty, you know, black is beautiful, black power, a very much a political term, even though two black psychologists in the 60s asked the question, so our ledge has grown as black people, but have we shrunk our ledge? So are you black enough if you study French cinema? So then the question of what black is gets in there, gets complicated, not just like what are your roots, but how does it show up externally in the world? Do you count? If you hike in Nepal, are you black? Oh yeah, are you really black? And I can't not tell you how many times I've had that conversation with black people when I was younger about the level and degree of blackness. So I came claim blackness because I understand its historical roots. I was a kid in the 60s. I grew up in a house where my father, yes, he had daishiki and I have this image in it. You know, he was all about it, angry, 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 you know? And so I, I own it. There's a sense of pride in it. There's a sense of it's been infused in me whether I like it or not because I grew up in a house that we understood black. I also say African-American 
because I also have a sense of that sort of claiming American identity in the best way possible when you've been told by a people long enough you don't belong and there's a way to claim it. But I want to tell you another story. So my father, he's got dementia now, but about 15 years ago, for years he collected guns. And um, when they moved from New York to Virginia, you have to go to the licensing. You have to go and get your license changed and everything in order to have the guns. And my father was in line with my mother and he said he got up there and there was a woman. And as my father put it, because he is not politically correct or didn't look like she was from America. Yeah. Yeah. My father black, he said it like that. And I just shake my hand like dad, you, you can't say that. He had to fill out a form about, and you know, they ask you your gender and they ask you your race and the option, you know, all the usual options. And there was African-American and my father was just in the mood that day. And my father said, I'm not marking African-American. I'm American. I've never been to Africa. And there was a black security guard standing at the door. My mother was like going, oh, no, oh, no. He was starting to go off about how he is American. Why does he have to mark a box that says African-American? He's not that he isn't proud that he's black, but he's never been to Africa. And then the security guard came over and my mother thought that, oh, my God, he's going to arrest him and take him out. And the security guard just looked at him. He was a black man and said, I want to shake your hand, sir. <laughs> um, and so... I understand that African-American is actually complicated. And ask any newly minted African immigrant, what, because it means something else. You come from, you got your own roots, you got your own history, family and otherwise, that you are proud of and want to own, and you are here. And wait a minute, the whole slavery history thing is that is not exactly your history. Like, so what does African-American actually encompass? So I think of it as, again, much like what I said to the earlier question, I have to be clear about where I stand with it. I'm most comfortable with black. You know, if I'm thinking beyond my own blackness, I might say diaspora, people of African descent, you know, people of African and European descent, people of Asian descent, because Asian American, what the hell, what? Oh, what, do you, you know, really, we've just denied how many different countries and sets of histories by using the term. And I know people want to say sometimes we don't have the time, but really we've had 450 years. I think we can get a little bit better at taking the time to think about what is it we're talking about? You know, I once, um, a number of years ago in Seattle, I, went, I decided to go to this film. I love to go to movies and I went to some documentary. It was the opening about Japanese internment. And this was probably I was there, I don't know, late 90s because I was living up in that area and I didn't know much about it. So I said, I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go see this. I was probably one of two black people in the audience. I mean, it was everybody in the audience looked like they were of Japanese descent. They were definitely of Asian descent and it was packed. And I sat next to, and I was in tears like at the because it's just moving. It's a moving human story, right? But I was so buoyed because the guy next to me looked at me and he was just smiling like he was he just told me he was so glad I was there. <laughs> like he said, "Why are you here?" Like you know, he knew why he was there, but he wanted to know why I was there. And we had this great conversation about like I felt like I had to be there. I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back. I'm saying that um, there's something about you know the work that I believe we all have to do at any given time, which doesn't deny the work we've already done. But I understand that my blackness at this moment, maybe, maybe something else may evolve into something else later, but it is always in relationship with others. And so I'm thinking about the fluidity of that blackness. You know, we as a black people, and I think black American with that very particular black history, I've understood at the core of, you know, the two things I've understood we've always collectively claimed and tried to claim is our freedom, in the broadest possible sense, and our humanity in the broadest possible sense. And I am tired of waiting for somebody else to give it to me. So for me, the way that I show up and claim blackness is with, at the core, this understanding of freedom, not just for myself, because I can't be free unless you are free too. Um, and also, how can I be fully human if I can't see that in who you are too? I hope that made sense. Yes, that's great. So we have three minutes left. I'll give you one last question. Um, and actually, we have two questions. I'll give them both. Maybe you have time to respond. 
Um, oh, you're echoing, the, the echo's there a little bit, so I'm not hearing, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so one is around cancel culture and accountability and how can we create accountability and calling people in without hostility. And then the second question is just, what is your take on reparations or dividends? And reparations, you... reparations or what was the last dividends. thing? Dividends. dividends. Okay. Let me, um, the dividends, I'm not sure about the dividends, but let me go back. Let's go to cancel culture and accountability because I love talking about that too. So uh, I, have I, I would like to cancel cancel culture. That is what I would like to do. When I'm feeling and when I'm not feeling particularly generous and uh, uh, just tired, I you know I think a cancel culture in one level is lazy. I think that you know it lets a lot of people off the hook from doing the real work. And and let me be really clear about this. So when when I hear white folks people who identify of European ancestry say, um, yeah, we're going to cancel. We're behind getting rid of them, cancel them out. I'm like, ooh, just let them off the hook for doing any work at all. Can anybody say mirror, please? Look, <laughs> look at that, right? Um, I've been telling people that when Christian Cooper walked into Central Park as a black gay black man and had his skin weaponized against him by the white woman, Amy Cooper, while I would love to meet Christian Cooper and um, and that may happen, have a conversation. And I feel like I, you know, I got you my brother and I know what it is. The person I really want to have a conversation with is Amy Cooper. That's where I want to go. You know why I want to go there? Because Amy Cooper took the hit for every white person in America. She took the hit. She lost everything for every white person in America. And can you tell me what has changed in terms of white supremacy? Has anything shifted? because Amy Cooper took the hit. You know, the thing for me is she should be held accountable. But that what does that accountability look like in terms of humanity? And what is the larger intention? I'm, I'm interested in change, which means we're gonna need everybody on board. Do you, I believe that Amy Cooper, if she was supported to actually really understand what it is she did and how it is she might do it differently, and then she put herself in front of an audience that looked like her and told that story, now there's some serious impact. The potential for that impact, and it actually gives people who look like me and Jamie a break. <laughs> from having to be the ones to hold that all the time, to duck and weave all the time. I want to support Amy Cooper to talk about the real pain that she experienced, that hopefully that moments of reflection, the new tools that she developed, the way she came out on the other side and can say there is another side. All the white people who are saying that they're afraid and are in denial and all those things, especially the afraid, afraid to say anything because, oh my God, what if it happens to us like Amy Cooper? And so they don't do anything because privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself. And you think you can stand there and be silent and no one will notice while well, everybody's noticing. So the other thing that I want to say about cancel culture is um, I often tell the story, Alice Walker is one of my favorite writers. And um, I followed and read all of the black writer, Alice Walker, who did A Color Purple, which she's most known for, but she's written a lot of other things. And when I received Color Purple, when it first came out from one of my aunts, it was the first time I was an avid reader. So I was kind of a little nerdy that way. And I was the first time I'd gotten a book where the focus in the center was a young black girl who didn't even have much education. Like she was the main character in the story. I'd never experienced anything like that. When the, the story, it sort of centers around this young black girl at a time in the 1800s, you know, slavery, Jim Crow, I think it's right after slavery, but it's Jim Crow segregation. But it centers around these, this black, these black people in a very particular way. And when the book, Steven Spielberg decided to make it into a movie in the 90s, and you might remember this, and when it came out, I had, I, you know, I loved the story. I had, and I love a lot of the acting in the story, but I had real problems initially with the movie because I just thought it was so pretty. And that's not exactly what Alice Walker was right. The, the show, excuse me, the expression, the show weren't, weren't pretty a lot of the time, right? But, you know, Oprah and Whoopi and everybody in it, like, was bringing it. Danny Glover played Mr. 
And he was an abusive black man. He was a black man who was abusive. He abused women badly in the movie. And by a certain point in the story, and also in the book, because Mr. was abusive, he's kicked out of the community. Man, he's canceled. <laughs> he's out. Alice Walker, who has said over and over again how much she loves her people, and you know, when she talks about black people, which she writes for and about them because they're also for and about her, and said she got the most hate mail from black people. And it broke her heart. She was depressed for almost three years because she wrote a book three years later about how depressed she was. And that was a hard place because getting hate mail from the people you love the most, I don't can't think of anything like worse than that, right? It broke her heart. Um, and in 2005, I was living in Atlanta and had an opportunity to go see opening night on Broadway of The Color Purple. And Oprah, it was an Oprah production, and I got to be there on opening night. And Oprah got on stage afterwards and was just like, yes, this was a magnificent production. She talked about making the movie, her whole place in the story. Then she invited Alice Walker up on stage. And Alice got up on stage, and the cast was standing all behind her. And she looked at it, and she said, this is a story about redemption. Because at the end of the book and the end of the movie, the women invite Mr., the character Mr., played by Danny Glover, back in. That is the most powerful moment in the story. And she didn't want anybody to forget that this is about redemption, the possibility of reconciliation, the possibility of change. The thing is, I'm always afraid of making a mistake. What if I get canceled? Then there's no place for growth. There's no, where's the love at? Where's the forgiveness at? Where's the chance for me to consider what I've done? And yes, be held accountable. I have to attend to those impacts of my bad behavior. And where's the chance for me to, prove myself differently, to learn something from it, to then kind of show up again. My biggest fear is of not belonging. I think I told all you that in the beginning. So I drive it into all this work, but at the end of the day, who the hell wants to be outside on your own, isolated, not counted, not seen? Not Amy Cooper, not Mr. From a Color Purple, and not me, regardless of the color of our skin. So the question I ask is really, what is the intention? What can accountability look like in service to that larger intention of something better? And accountability is real. Like, you know, there's something to be learned, I think, when it is done well. You know, some of us have had people who have raised us who showed us what that looked like. <laughs> and they still loved us at the end of the day, but you know what I'm talking about. So how do we bring that um, to bear upon this idea of addressing that? And the reparations question is a harder one for me because I haven't fully thought, I can't even say it, I haven't fully thought that through. I'm still hung up on what does that mean for my indigenous brothers and sisters? Because it is not one without the other. And I can't, I, I'm not sure, um, I don't want to think of it in a linear fashion. It has to be this first and then that. I don't want to think of it in terms of a hierarchy because that's white supremacist thinking. I don't want to think of it as um, it has to be one and not the other. I think, you know, at the at the bottom of both of those experiences of decolonization, of giving back the land, of reparations, of acknowledging the pain, hurt, and labor of black people on the land is the question again of freedom, of recognition, of apology, of righting a set of significant wrongs and writing them at this time. <clears throat> and I think that all of us uh, in both those areas in particular are the ones that need to be on the front lines of that conversation and how we want to construct that experience. I, I can't, it's, I haven't figured out yet how to have a reparations conversation without having an understanding of decolonization and 
I haven't learned, that's a learning that I'm having as I continue to have conversations with people who are indigenous. What, like I said before, what, how can I show up and what can I do while also thinking about, I want black people to be reparated, which really I believe means repair. And that rift, that treatment, how, how do we repair that in this moment? And it's probably not any one thing. I think it can show up in different areas, politics and money, you know, you're saying dividends. I think there's all these different ways. I had this funny skit that I wish that Dave Chappelle would do around reparations, but I don't know if it's appropriate for me to share what it is. <laughs> I just... Well, thank you so much. This yeah. has been really, really amazing. Um, I don't know if you're going to be with us the rest of the day in and out of sessions. People may see you, but if not, um, you know, we just appreciate your time and your wisdom so much. This has really been um, just a phenomenal session. I thank you. I And I would love to. And I I'm doing so many things and I may pop back in because I kind of need this. <laughs> so today or tomorrow, um, I um, thank you all for allowing me to be here. It is like a, a kind of, it's a different kind of therapy session. I could say some things and you invited me in and um, I'll end by saying in the immortal words of Snoop Dogg, I know people are like, what is she saying? The other night, one of the many things I like to watch on TV is sometimes I just like to watch The Voice. It's one of the singing shows because I like to see all the different people come in and share their beautiful voices. And one of the guest you know, um, consultants with these young people who are training and practicing for their performance is Snoop Dogg. And, you know, he's an older, wiser man now, right? So Snoop Dogg came on and he gave his, you know, his comments, his critique to this young um, singer. And the young singer was so happy with it. Wow, thank, it's just a thank you so much for um, telling me that. And what he said in the most humblest way possible, he said, thank you for receiving the information. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you.